Hey, so I have something to show you guys. They're kind of hard to get, and I went all the way to Colorado to get this one. It's my Run Rabbit Run belt buckle. So hopefully you've seen the video that I just posted about the Run Rabbit Run and about my whole experience there. I hope that that kind of helped explain a little bit about like what it felt like. And if you haven't seen it, Go ahead and check it out. I'm gonna put a link like right here. There's no reason not to like click on it right now. I also put out a podcast. So that's gonna be kind of like the whole story of everything that happened. This video, what I want to do is kind of do more of like the visual side of that that I couldn't do on the podcast. And so I wanna show you some of the gear I used and I will walk through a little bit of the race and tell you some of the stories. Starting off, um, this was my race packet. For a lot of my races, I try to do stuff like this. Um, this is going back all the way to my triathlon days, doing Ironman, all that. Um, but I like to print stuff off, and this was the aid station chart. Like, I made some highlights and stuff. The highlights are basically, like, where there's going to be crew access, where possibly uh, I can pick up a pacer, drop bags, things like that. Printed off the race profile of the course, and I thought it'd be interesting to see, like, so this up here is the Run Rabbit Run. And down here, this is the grindstone course. So I thought it'd be interesting to see kind of like where all of this stuff like lined up, like and how it was gonna compare to last year. I always print off a map of the race if possible. This one, just black and white, didn't print very well. The rest of this is the whole runner's manual. This race was a little bit confusing uh, for setting up drop bags because you got three drop bags, but you're gonna be able to see them seven times. I studied this basically every day out in Colorado. This was always like sitting somewhere where I knew exactly where it was and I was looking at it, studying it, just to kind of go over some of the gear I started with. Uh, shoes first. I started with Ultra Olympus. As you can see, these don't have the laces in them right now because I took them out and sent them through the washing machine because they were dirty. These shoes were Incredible. Uh, I had two different pairs of them. I started the race with one pair and then I had a second pair uh, That I switched into at like mile like 55 or so. I didn't really have a whole lot of time to break either of these new pairs in uh, Basically each one of them had like 15 miles on them, but that was like totally fine. I'm very used to this shoe uh, I run all my ultras now Not all of them. I run a lot of my races now in Olympus. Shout out to Ultra. Thank you so much. Olympus rocked. I wore Drymax socks and I only planned on wearing two pairs. If you listen to the podcast there, I kind of go into a lot more detail about it, but basically I planned on wearing one pair at the beginning of the race and then switching to a fresh pair when I also switched my shoes. And that was great, except for towards the very end on the second day where it started getting really hot again. Uh, the socks just kind of quit. I think they quit doing what they're supposed to do like dry max socks They're supposed to like pull the moisture out and I think they just kind of stopped and Then I just wore like a pair of ultra shorts and shirt uh, my pack. I have this Solomon pack It's the 5L and it's pretty <laughs> nasty and it smells horrible like you can see like how hot it was like there's all this salt uh, stains and everything this has been actually the only ultra running pack I've ever had and I wear it for all my races. If anything breaks on it, I'll probably buy another one exactly like it. In there, at the start of the race, I had two soft flasks and these are great, I love them. A lot of people give them hate like on the internet, but they are amazing. Like if you've never used them, like basically the way they work is you fill them up, put them in your pack and then you like quickly like suck the air out of them and then they like don't make any sound. Like they don't really bounce around that much either. And then as you drink more and more of what's in them, they just kind of collapse and they make, they get really small, like they're awesome. And then I had this uh, bladder in the back of my pack and this came in really handy. It got hot. Um, it's kind of annoying to carry a bladder. It really does come in handy. Also to start the race, I have a set of black diamond poles. They're the carbon version. All this stuff is in my ultra running kit which is gonna be linked right down below so you can find any of this stuff on Amazon. Basically, they you know, they fold up like this. When you wanna use them, you just kind of open them up and then you just pull this until it pops, this little spring action thing right there, and they're good to go. One thing that I do that I don't see a lot of people 
do, which I think is a pretty sweet hack, is on my right pole, me either right or left, I put a piece of duct tape right here so that I can tell it's my right pole. Because when you're running and you pull these out of your pack and you're like trying to fumble around and trying to open them, uh, it's just really nice to know that like, hey, this one is my right pole. And then also, I want to give a lesson right now about how to use these poles. I see a lot of people not using the straps. They'll use their poles like this and they'll hold the straps or they'll like fling them over the top or something like this. That puts so much stress on your hands and your forearms and you have to like grip your poles like really tight. The way these work, put your hand in through the bottom, just like this, and then you kind of just wrap your hand around it and grab the pole. And now when I'm putting pressure down, I can actually not even hold on to the pole and it's still like I'm still getting all of the downward force that I would be getting had I be gripping it. So you actually have to grip it a lot less. This is how you're supposed to hold these poles. Just like this. Then you can like open your hands. Like if you have to pull out something from your pack, like they're still on you. It takes so much of the stress out of your hands. Your hands have to do a lot less work. So this is how you're supposed to hold them, okay? So if you see other people that are holding their poles like this, like please tell them that there's an easier way. And some people are afraid that like if they fall, this is gonna be like connected to them and it's gonna like spear them somehow. I've never ever had a problem. I think if you start falling, your hand's just gonna go out like that. Some people enter from the top and then hold on to it like that. And then they say, well, look, it's still like holding me like this. Well. It is, but it's also not. And like, also if you fall, this is the part where you actually can get in trouble. This is the wrong way. There's actually a whole lot of pressure on my thumb right now when I'm pushing down as hard as I can. They actually say like, you can like break your thumb if you do it like that. Just to review, go in from the bottom, wrap your hands around it and grab the pole just like that. Now that, if you fall, your hand comes straight out. All that pressure is now on your hands. You don't even have to really grip it. So a lot of times when I was hiking, I wasn't even really like holding onto the poles. I was just kind of like going like this. So do it like this, okay everybody? These poles, they were kind of expensive, totally worth it. Especially if you're a middle of the pack to back of the pack runner, you're just trying to finish the race, you should use poles in a race that has a lot of vertical. If it's a flat race, you could probably still benefit from using poles. It's probably not as crucial to your success. I also started with this GoPro and this GoPro is actually the Hero 5 and they just came out with the Hero 7, which is supposed to be like amazing. I'm still using the 5 because it still works. Like this is crashed and fallen. It served me well and it's still going. I can fit it in my pack. I just like slide it right in there and it just like sits like right there, like perfectly. And so I always have it right there i can just pull it out and slide it back in so that's what i started the race with other gear that i use um, i've got these bags that i just got off amazon camping dry bags but i use these for my drop bags because they're huge but you can also make them small if you just roll them up and then this is how they close they close just like that so now it's like perfectly sealed. So if this sits out in the rain or even if it falls underwater somehow, stuff inside is gonna be fine. Nutrition, what I did was I separated my nutrition out into like these little baggies and put them in the drop bags. And I labeled like out or in so that I knew like when in the race I was planning on uh, using this specific bag. For caffeine, I used these Vogue tabs and they're really good, but uh, as I, kind of explained in my podcast, I didn't get as much benefit from these as I had, as I did at Grindstone. And I think it was because all the way up until race morning, I was drinking two cups of coffee in the morning. I was kind of like used to caffeine and I don't think they had the same effect. I also tried some caffeine pills that my pacer Matt had and they didn't really do much either. In the future for 100 milers, I'm gonna like lay off the caffeine for like maybe two weeks beforehand. I think that'll help. I started the race with gaiters on my shoes. That was a big, big plus. Honestly, any trail race, I'm gonna wear gaiters from now on because I stopped and untied my shoes twice and I never had to get anything out of my shoes during this whole race. The only two times I stopped and took my shoes off were at the halfway point when I switched shoes and then towards the very end when I thought that maybe my feet had exploded. Definitely recommend gaiters. You kind of saw these in the video uh, about the actual race. Like, I'm a data guy. I really like to know like where I am and like what's like uh, the elevation, how much time I have, things like that. So I make these little baggies. It's the aid station chart printed off the website. And it's, this one is the first 50 miles. 
and on the back here I also put in the elevation chart so that I can see uh, exactly where I am, how far until the next aid station, what the elevation is going to be, and then I can look back here and I can see kind of like what's ahead. This is the second half of the race, I did the exact same thing, uh, you can see there. So the way this works is I kind of like fold it up just like this, basically into like thirds, like get it real small. And then I roll it and I don't really try to, I don't really do much to try and keep it pretty. Like I just kind of like roll it up just like that. And then I stick it in my pack, like right here. And that way it's always right here. And I can just like whip it out, unroll it, see where I am. Look at the elevation chart, roll back up, put it away and I'm good. These really help me like keep my sanity when I'm out there. For me, I think I might feel a little bit lost if I didn't have some sort of data telling me like what's going on. Let's talk about the race a little bit. Day before the race, I was at the pool with my kids. You can see right up the ski slope, big mountains kind of all around and see this like cloud come over the mountains. And I'm like, oh no, it might be raining soon. And then started to realize this was not a rain cloud, but this was a cloud of smoke from a fire. Kind of started to freak out a little bit because I started thinking, is this race in danger? Like, are they gonna cancel the race? And then I started thinking, is this town in danger? Like, are the people here? Like, are we gonna have to evacuate? Because I mean, the mountains were like right there. And then this cloud of smoke was like bigger than the mountains and it was coming towards us. And the thing is at the time I was at the pool, I didn't have my phone on me. So I was just kind of like sitting there worrying. And we sat there for a while. And so eventually went in and actually talked to the concierge at the hotel she was like, oh yeah, that's the Spring Creek fire that's been burning for like two months. It actually ended up changing the race a little bit. They didn't have to modify the 100 mile course, but the 50 mile course actually had to get rerouted. Originally, the 100 milers and the 50 milers were really not supposed to see each other like the whole time because they were gonna share some of the trail, but like there was no chance that anybody from our race was gonna be on it at that time. But then what ended up happening was they ended up using quite a bit of our trail, ended up using one aid station as well, passing and being around a lot of the 50 milers, which kind of changed the dynamics of both races. I'm really thankful that their race didn't have to get canceled. I'm thankful our race didn't have to get canceled. I think they did a fantastic job to let this race even happen in the first place because the 50 mile course was supposed to go right through where this fire was. And the reason why the clouds were so big and everything that day is because the winds had changed and the fire actually spread quite a bit the day before the race it spread a ton like the day before the race this fire was started by a person so that kind of makes it even more sad it didn't even happen naturally like with a lightning strike or something it was just like a person being careless started this fire just a sad sad thing so the day before i set up all my drop bags uh sealed them up that really made the race feel real like it was really happening took them to the place where we're supposed to drop them off uh picked up my bib this is my race bib I was number 441. Like you can see, it's like folded over. I always do this to my race bibs because it makes them smaller when you pin them on your shorts, but then also it makes these corners so much stronger. It's basically like this pin is pinned into four pieces of this material because it's folded over just like that. And so like if your hand accidentally hits or this gets caught on something, each corner is going through four times. It's just a really good way to do it, in my opinion, if the race lets you do it. At Leadville, in the race packet it said not to fold over the bib. I think it was because there was like a timing chip in the back, but they didn't explain why. And so it was just kind of like, well, if I fold it over, like, are you gonna like disqualify me? Like, so that was kind of like weird. This race, there was no timing chip. That was my bib. Picked all that up and then went to the race meeting. In the race meeting, we had the race director talking to us, Fred Abramowitz. He was awesome. Told a lot of really cool stories. Uh, they gave away a lot of stuff. I didn't win anything. Ultra was the title sponsor of the race. In fact, they're actually on the back of the shirt. Race meeting was really cool. Uh, Fred Abramowitz was just a really, seems like a really awesome guy. Uh, one of my favorite parts was, he was getting towards the end of his talk and he was like, now this is the point in the night where everyone wants me to give a pep talk. Come on, like these racers want a pep talk. And then he was like, well, this is not gonna be a pep talk. 
there's going to be incredible pain and it's gonna hurt more than you think it can. That just really stuck with me and I thought that was just such a cool quote. He was just like leveling with you and he was honest with about everything. Like they were talking about wild animals and he was like, yeah, there's gonna be wild animals. Every year people see bears, mountain lions, like every year people see this stuff. People see moose, elk, everything. He's talking about just like how much it's gonna hurt and how much like quitting is not an option and he was just really upfront with it all and I just really thought that was cool. He didn't try and sugarcoat anything. Like you shouldn't with a hundred mile race. A pre-race meeting was cool, met up with Tommy. That's also when Matt, my pacer showed up. And so we chilled for a while that night and just kind of talked about the plan for the next day. And then it was time to go to bed. I actually didn't go to bed that early. Like I think I went to bed at like 10 PM. It's kind of hard to try and sleep the night before. Okay, so the race start. Uh, the race started at 8 a.m. I was still kind of on Indiana time, Eastern time, and I kind of purposely tried to stay that way for the week leading up to the race because I knew that if I stayed on Eastern time, it would make the race start quite a bit easier. And all throughout the week, I was waking up like five o'clock, like ready to go. So race morning actually woke up right at about five o'clock, feeling great. Was able to just have a really relaxing morning, ate breakfast. I had just had like coffee and a granola bar, basically just what I normally eat. Had like no stress on race morning, like it was great. Our place that we were staying in was like five minutes away from the starting line, so that was awesome. So about like five minutes before the race, everyone started lining up. There's a big arch like to set the scene, like this is a ski resort, so there's like big towering hotels all around. There's the gondola in the middle that goes all the way up the mountain. Lots of restaurants, lots of places like, and so everyone was kind of crowded around this big open area. There was a big ultra arch for the starting line. So everyone lines up and I kind of always go towards the back, like maybe two thirds of the way back, middle of the pack, something like that. Uh, there's no reason for me to be in the front. I'm not gonna be there very long if I do line up there, so why do it? <laughs> It was just really cool. Like they had kind of loud music going and it was just like so much energy. That moment, like I just thought it was so cool looking around and just like seeing like all of these people that have put in the work to be here. Like no one looked like they weren't supposed to be there. Everyone looked like they had put in work. And I just started thinking about like how many hours of training does this group represent? And how many miles have we ran? And I would just love to, like, I kind of wish that they would have like, you know, like when you do like an Ironman, like they always take a picture of your bike to see like what kind of wheels you're wearing. Like they always make you fill out these surveys of what type of shoes, what type of nutrition. Sometimes I wish that these like ultras would do that too, because it would be cool to see stats. It would have been awesome to see like how many miles people had run collectively to be here and like how many hours of training and all that sort of stuff. So that just kind of struck me. And it was just a, it's just a really cool moment, like right before the start. And then like the gun goes off and we all go and we're kind of on like this, like paved path for a while. And then we just like take a hard left turn and we go like straight up the mountain, start this 4,000 foot climb. It's a steep ski slope. And I mean like steep, <laughs> dig in. And I didn't really pull out my poles until about halfway up to the top. First climb went great, like no issues. I actually met up with a guy named Wayne who had met online. He had done grindstone the year before, same year that I did it. We had a lot to talk about right off the bat. So that was really cool. I hung with him for actually the first 50 miles. Like it was really awesome having like a buddy out there. The first 50 miles like went by pretty, like no issues. I mean, it got super hot during the day. It got up to like 80 degrees really really hot climb down into fish creek falls and like back up it was just like brutal like the whole trail was like rocks and you can see that in my video like pretty technical in a lot of spots like i fell one time in between two boulders and kind of skinned myself up a little bit and kind of like bashed my chest on one of the boulders that was actually a lapse in concentration which you should never do when you're trail running i packed a whole lot of gels and but i also knew in the back of my mind that I probably wasn't going to use as much of that, but I wanted to have it available. Like my plan going in was really to use the aid stations for my nutrition. And that worked out really well because these aid stations were awesome. Like they were packed with good food. Every aid station had hot food. Like at every aid station I was like eating ramen, soup, mashed potatoes, ginger ale, Coke. At every aid station I grabbed a pack of those gummy like chews. I probably got 95% of my nutrition for the whole race from aid stations. And the stuff I brought, I don't even think I really used much of it. That was kind of like, I'm glad I had it, but whatever, I didn't use it. Every aid station I filled up my two front bottles with Tailwind and I filled up the back 
bladder with just cold water. And that worked out really well. About the course a little bit. So this was definitely not a beginner course. Obviously it's a hard rock qualifier, so it's gonna be hard. But even more than that, the trail markings were little to none. Uh, like you kind of had to really trust your instincts and know where you were going in this race. A lot of races, They've got flags in the ground, they've got ribbons hanging, they've got reflectors, they've got glow sticks. You can always see like two or three flags or at least when you're standing at one flag, you can see the next flag like for the whole race. This race was not like that at all. There were long sections like up to a mile, maybe more where I don't think I saw a flag. Turns were like barely marked. Like there was one turn where the second, like during the day, Second day, I was with my pacer Matt and we just started laughing because we were looking, there's a fork in the road and it's like, obvious left and obvious right. Most races, they would have had like caution tape across one trail and like a hundred flags like leading you this way and like streamers and like maybe even a person standing out there telling you to go that way. Well, this race had one flag and it wasn't even like obviously telling you which way to go. Like if here's the middle in between the two trails, it was like three inches to the right. <laughs> like you could tell that they wanted you to go that way, but it also wasn't obvious. So this is a hard course, lots of vertical, lots of really technical sections. It's hot, it's cold, there's wild animals, but then also it was like barely marked. Most of the times wasn't a big problem because it was out really like, I mean, this was like wilderness. A lot of the time there was only one trail that you could be on. There wasn't, it's not like some places where there's just hundreds of trails out there. I was totally fine with, I thought it was actually kind of cool, like, but sometimes you wouldn't see a flag for like 30 to 45 minutes and you just had to deal with it mentally keep going. So around mile like 45, we're sitting at the aid station. It was supposed to be mile 45. Both me and Wayne were talking and we were looking at our watches and we were like, what mile marker does it say on your watch? And both of us had about four extra miles than we were supposed to have. So we asked a couple other people and they were like, yeah, this course is definitely long. This whole time up until about 50 miles, we were shooting to finish the race in under 30 hours. Cause if you did that, you get a little bit of a cooler belt buckle. So each aid station that we were coming in, we were like just before or right on time, or maybe like just after, but we had a really good shot of getting that 30 hour finish and getting that cooler belt buckle. But around this 45 to 50 mile area, we realized that this was probably slipping away and not gonna be an option because the course was already a couple miles long. And so I say in the video, at that point when we realized that we thought that maybe this course was gonna end up being like 108 miles, which it ended up being 108 miles. So that really like threw everything off because those extra eight miles like could have been, depending on what type of terrain it was, like it could have been an extra couple hours. Right there, that threw off a lot of people who were shooting for this 30 hour, including us. So around this halfway point, we got a little bit down. Then also we're coming into the Olympian Hall aid station, which is supposed to be at mile 51 but our watches had it more like 55. <laughs> we were only about a mile or two outside of town where the aid station was. We're both like talking, so we're kind of making noise. All of a sudden, we hear this, like off to our left, like we hear this like scream, like real quick. And it sounded like a woman screaming, like less than a second, just like really fast, just like this scream. We're both like, whoa, did you hear that? What was that? We kind of look behind us, there's no one behind us, no one in front of us. And we are like, I don't think like the trail like loops around. This is a pretty much a straight shot into town. And then about like, like two minutes later, like we weren't making any noise at that moment and we heard it again and it sounded like it was closer. And it was just like this really fast like scream. We're like, what in the world was that? And we actually like kind of joked to each other. We were like, what if that is like a mountain lion or something? <laughs> then we got into town and we started talking to people and some other people that had just gone through that section as well. We're like, yeah, we heard that too. And then this guy working at the aid station overheard us and he was like, you know, uh, mountain lions that are defending their territory sound like a woman screaming. <laughs> So we realized at that moment that a mountain lion was just defending its territory against us and like trying to get us to go away. And we knew that about 13 miles later, we were gonna have to go right back through that section. So it was not like a nice, happy thought. <laughs> kind of a scary thought. So mile 50 is where I picked up Matt, my pacer. He's from Colorado too. He's like this incredible like mountain guy. Like he's climbed all of the 14ers. He's a really awesome guy. The other semi animal encounter we had was uh, we were coming into mile like 60-ish somewhere in here and there's an aid station. And this aid station is actually called Lane of Pain, which was appropriately named this year because we're coming in and we are maybe like 50 yards away and there's these two like high school boys like standing in the trail 
and like they stopped us and they were like, hey, are either of you guys allergic to bees? <laughs> and we're both like, no, like why? And it's the middle of the night. You're not like thinking about like bees. I don't know. Like, I've never like seen bees in the middle of the night. So you're not really thinking about that. They were like, okay, good that you're not allergic because somebody just drove their car over a beehive right by the aid station and we're all getting attacked. So we were like, what? And these kids are like, so don't hang around. Just like, if you need something, get it real fast and go. And we're like, this is not what you want to hear. At mile like 63 of a, you want to have the option to stop and take your time if you need to. So like we get to the table and it's like, it's a decent aid station, like lots of food, like drinks and, there's no one there. Pitch black, like we're just shining our headlamps on stuff. I see Matt and these bees are just like landing all over him. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, out of here. So we like really quick, like filled up some water and we left. About like 50 yards down the trail past it was some more people and the aid station captain was there. He was like, hey, did you guys get stung? Like, so sorry about this. One of the moms of one of these high school kids was trying to do a U-turn on the road and she backed up over this beehive and, we're all getting attacked and we've all been stung at least twice. So that was cool. And we also had to come back around through that aid station later again. That was the only other sort of animal encounter that we had. <laughs> Everything else was like totally cool. Like no animals attacked us, no nothing. Like we were fine. Didn't even really see any. Like saw a bunch of rabbits and like marmots and stuff. I think we saw some deer, nothing else. At like mile 65 or so, we came back to, it was actually like more like mile 70. But like we came back to the Olympian Hall aid station. And I'm looking at this aid station chart. We're just sitting there and we weren't really like taking our time, like, but we were definitely sitting down and just taking a break. And I'm looking at this like aid station chart and I'm like, the heck, like this doesn't make sense anymore. 13 miles ago, I was just barely an hour past the 30 hour time. Now I'm 15 minutes past the 36 hour time. I was like, what in the world? Like, this doesn't make sense at all. I really freaked out because it said, if you want to hit 36 hour finish, you have to leave this aid station at 5 a.m. And it was already 5.15. And me and Matt are just sitting there and we're both like, what in the world? Like, and so I freaked out. And like, so we both kind of like jumped up and we left in a hurry. And the next section was like this pretty big climb. So we really like crushed it. The goal pace for this section was like two and a half hours. And we did it in less than an hour. Matt really like pushed me at this point and it was just awesome. Like we ran a lot of it and we ran pretty fast. A lot of it was uphill. A lot of times in ultras at this point, you're running the downhills, kind of shuffling the flats and then walking every chance that the ground goes like this. Like if it's, if it's just like a little bump, like you're walking. We weren't, we were running like almost the whole thing. So we, I made up a ton of time there. And I, th I think something's going on with the aid station chart. And if anybody else had that same experience, like let me know because something had to have been messed up there when 13 miles prior, I was like right on the 30 hour time almost. And then all of a sudden I'm like past the 36 hour time goal. And it was just like, it didn't make sense at all. Yeah, so let me know if that happened to you too. So in the morning, like the sun came up night was actually really freezing cold it was down in the low 30s maybe even lower than that up on top of the mountain sun came up and it started warming up again and i was really super sleepy at night like the caffeine pills like weren't really working that well i had a lot of moments i didn't ever like sleepwalk i just had a lot of moments where i was kind of like dozing off and just really having a hard time moving but like as soon as the sun came up it was man i'm awake and i'm alert and i'm ready to go and like this is good having a good time started getting warm again, took off the jacket and gloves, kind of got back to what I felt was more like, a little bit more like running and just feeling good. But the biggest mistake of the whole race was something I had decided to do beforehand and it kind of backfired on me. Um, Knowing that at Grindstone, I think I, I think I wore like six pairs, six or seven pairs of socks at Grindstone. I was just thinking about that and I was like, every time that probably took me five, of 10, 15 minutes maybe to sit down, take my shoes off, change my socks, because every time I like dried them off and I put more like squirrel's nut butter on them and put new socks on and put my shoes on. So it could have taken like 20 minutes each time. I'm thinking like all of that could have possibly added up two hours of just time spent changing my shoes. And I really didn't want to do that again. So I made the decision before the race to wear two pairs of shoes and two pairs of socks and not change socks any more times. I did have socks in my drop bags if I felt like I had a really bad emergency. I stuck to my plan and I only wore two pairs of socks and that really ended up backfiring on me because 
the second pair, as the sun came up the next day and it started getting really hot again, they just got really wet with sweat and it was just like the blisters came on in force. Basically every pressure point on my foot had a blister. With about 10 miles to go, something like terrible happened to my feet. I'm going and I know I have blisters everywhere, but then all of a sudden like I take a step with my right foot and it feels like the skin on the bottom of my foot just kind of like split open, like right on the pad of your foot and it was so much pain that I actually had to stop walking and sit down because I was like shaking. I was like, Matt, I like, I gotta check what's going on with my foot. I think something really bad just happened. So I sit down and that's the second time I took my shoes off. I took my sock off, looked at it. The bottom of my feet were like all white and like pruney and there's definitely like I could see blisters but like it, nothing was like split open, like nothing was hanging, like my toes weren't falling off. It looked fine. So I like put my socks and shoes back on. But it was just like so incredibly painful to walk on. And then not more than five minutes later, the exact same thing happened on the left foot and it just felt like the skin just like ripped open from like heel to toe. Felt like I was walking on fire or knives or whatever. Like, I don't know if I've ever felt that type of pain. My whole body was just tense from it and shaking because it was hurting so bad just to walk. Anytime I had to go downhill, it was worse. Anytime I had stepped on a rock a little weird, it was just like that whole body, like the nerves in your whole body just like feel like this intense pain. And that was like really, really horrible and I don't know if it was 100% due to not changing my socks, but I know that didn't help. After the race, I kind of Googled some stuff and I think my feet uh, were macerated. It all kind of piled on and my feet just kind of, I think the nerves in there just kind of like gave up basically. But that was like the biggest mistake I made and the most pain I went through. Uh, and that was like mile 95. Like I was almost done, but it took a huge toll on the end of my race. And honestly, my legs like felt good. My legs honestly still felt okay. Like my body felt pretty good. It was just the bottom of my feet were just like, horrible. Well, the last climb you go up like Mount Warner and there's an aid station up there and we we're kind of like chilling there for a while and I was talking to some of the medical staff about my feet and uh, one of the medical guys he just was he was funny like he was just he was a cool guy like he was obviously a runner too and he was just like you've only got six miles to the finish I think you should just suck it up and go. I don't know what I'm gonna do for you up here. <laughs> I was also talking to a couple that was up there they were kind of giving us some advice on the descent down and basically it's six miles 4,000 foot drop and it's pretty much a straight drop. Like there's switchbacks, but you're always going down. That was just really good to hear. They were talking about how most people do it in like an hour and 45 to two hours. I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to be walking on these feet for another two hours. I just told Matt as we were leaving the aid station, we're bombing this descent. We are going for it. We leave the aid station and we just start bombing it. And we're like running fast. Like we're hitting like sub eight minute miles on certain parts. And at the end of a hundred, that is pretty Pretty crazy for someone like in my position in the race. And we made it down in 48 minutes. The last six miles, it was crazy. We were there so fast that my family had actually taken a break and went to a restaurant to go eat dinner because they saw me check in at Mount Warner, like online, they were tracking. And they were like, oh, like at this pace, like it's gonna be like an hour and a half, two hours. But we made it down in 48 minutes and it was just insane. Like coming down, coming into that finish line, this huge crowd of people and you see that arch and it was just absolutely an incredible feeling. Thought a lot about how hard it was to get there, like how much work went into it, my family, like just everybody that had kind of encouraged me along the way, everyone I had run with along the way. In all my training runs, I thought about it all. It was just a really, really powerful moment and the funny thing is you didn't have to get your feet wet at all during this race it was really dry and like all the river and stream crossings like you could hop from rock to rock where there were bridges but 20 feet away from the finish line there's this little creek that goes kind of like through the ski town and they make you run through it <laughs> which is just kind of funny so like 20 feet away from the finish everyone gets their feet soaked but it kind of felt good because it was like freezing cold and my feet were in so much pain that I was like, whatever, I don't even care. Like my feet and like, so I went in and crossed the finish line, got this buckle and man, am I so proud to have come from Indiana out to Colorado, up at elevation, 100 miles in the mountains, run rabbit run, another hard rock qualifier. So I crossed the finish line in 34 hours and like 20, 
some minutes, 25 minutes or something like that, which is actually almost exactly the same time that I finished Grindstone in. But this race was seven miles longer, so I ran it quite a bit faster, by a couple hours probably, because those last couple miles, they take hours, they don't take minutes. 288 people started the race, I think 170 finished it, and I got 120th place or something like that. Top 50% of those that started the race, I feel so blessed so proud, so happy, so like relieved that I did it. I just have to thank you guys for encouraging me along the way. I have to thank Ultra for all the support they've given me over these last couple years. Thank you to my family, all the sacrifice that they've put in. Thank you guys so much for watching. Like this has just been such a fun journey. Again, documenting my way to Steamboat Springs and the Run Rabbit Run 100. I'm just, I feel so blessed to be able to do what I do and so blessed to have people that actually care about this and watch these videos and encourage me and it's just so awesome so thank you guys for watching there's gonna be more videos more podcasts coming out i'm gonna have more time now that i'm not training as much i'm still running but not training as much recovery is going well back out running past week i ran like 25 miles so it's like i'm not dead like like i said like my legs my body felt good it was just my feet were so freaking messed up that was the biggest thing and that's why recovery took longer like a week out i was ready to go like i felt like i could go run i just had to take it easy be to let my feet heal as far as future plans i don't really know exactly i'm for sure gonna put my name in the hat for western states and hard rock probably not getting into either of both of those but this fall and winter i'll probably do there's another there's a marathon coming up that i kind of want to do another 50 miler that i might do as far as next year i'm not really sure so if there's cool races that you guys have done or are planning on doing, let me know. I'm just kind of like open, like it's only been like two weeks since the race. I'm still just like trying to be thankful for that and just focus on that and the accomplishment and just recover. And so I don't know what I'm gonna do next year, but it will be something. But yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Once again, the Run Rabbit Run 100, amazing race. Awesome race directors, such a good place to go. Steamboat Springs is great. But yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye.